Welcome to Common Connection. I'm your host, Brett Getman. All right, well, welcome everybody. I don't even know what episode number this is. I think we're on number four or something. But Sounds anyway, good. we have Josh Underwood with us. Uh, okay, so I've got to tee this up properly and introduce Josh to those folks that don't know Josh. He is a great realtor right here in the Phoenix area, Gilbert. He is the co-owner, co-founder, co-owner of the Second Mile Group based right here in Phoenix. They sell real estate all over the Phoenix Valley, but you also even go up to like Sholo and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the White Mountains too. as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, he's driven by a desire to help people with their home ownership, home ownership dreams. And uh, in addition to real estate, Josh is also a guide with K2 Adventure Travel. His climbing resume includes multiple summits of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, Mount Everest, base camp in the Himalayas, a successful summit of Mount Rainier in Washington State, my home area, and numerous Grand Canyon rim to rim and rim, rim, rim hikes. I had to read that one twice and then I figured <laughs> out what it, what it meant. Josh is also a Knowles, uh, would you say certified? Yeah, Knowles well, certified? Well, first responder. Yeah, yeah, National Outdoor Leadership School. That is a big deal. I uh, remember looking into that myself. And is also a wilderness first responder as well as a trained in CPR and first aid. He lives in Gilbert with his amazing wife, Shelby. There you go. So there you go. For those that don't know Josh, <laughs> now you're going to get to know him. Fair thanks enough. for coming on. Yeah, man. thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, so before we dig into the wilderness stuff because i know i'm just going to geek out and want to hear all your cool yeah, stories for sure yeah but tell us about real estate so how'd you get into real estate and how long you've been doing that and all that yeah so i've, I've been doing it just under 20 years now so okay. um you know i kind of had a, a little bit of it in my family my dad was in the home building business as a kid um and so i kind of had that just around you know um, and then i had some various jobs right out of high school i kind of went on the road and did some liquidation stuff and had a lot of fun and um, and then would come back and have a normal job for a few months and then take off again. Uh, so I worked at, I worked for America West Airlines. That kind of ages me there. But I was just going to ask, what kind of normal <laughs> jobs did you have? Yeah. Well, an airline. Yeah, what, I worked, were you worked throwing, on the ramp, you know. At throwing America, bags? Or? Yeah, throwing okay, bags, nice. pushing back planes, that kind of thing. And then Fun. Um, I worked at Costco for a little bit, you know, okay. stocking shelves. And um, I worked for a, a couple call centers doing that stuff. I worked in restaurants. Um, so kind of all kinds of stuff, you know, just... You know, not necessarily trying to find the, the, the career, but just just trying to see what's next kind of thing. You sure. Know? And then um, and then eventually I, I, got, I landed at um, Chase, which was bank one at that point, And I okay. worked for them for for quite a few years. Um, and I got to a point, I think, where I just, you know, um, into the to the, the, the sort of you hit your ceiling as far as what you're going to do for income um, without, you know, just your sort of minute increases mm -hmm. every year and so i just kind of wanted to, to see what uh what real estate might bring me so i took night school took okay. my license um and then kind of tried to put my my foot in the door just yeah inch into it and i think we all know for those of, of us that have done that it just doesn't work you know um you really got to commit to it so i kind of just jumped in um in 2000 end of 2004 2005 really full time and uh, you know, it was tough at first, but, you know, it was a really kind of crazy market for a, for a new agent at that time, um, working with young folks that didn't have a whole lot more than, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a minimum down payment type thing. But I uh, got into it and, um, you know, just never looked back. Loved it ever since. And, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a good a good career um, for, for my personality, for, for the way I want to live life and um, just kind of have the um, independence um, to do things. Obviously, you have to for work sure. hard to... To produce but um but yeah so i gotta ask yeah how important of a background was it coming from banking how did that help you in real estate you know um because i've known a lot of realtors that had i don't know if you did personal banking or yeah. residential loan but just having a basic understanding sure. of the banking industry yeah um, i think you know i wasn't really in the lending world i was more in the business banking customer service side okay. of things so I think just, you know, uh, just the relationship with people and dealing mm -hmm. with high pressure situations, uh, taking escalated calls, you know, as a supervisor for a while, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of stuff kind of just guides you in life. But um, definitely I saw that people that, that went into the mortgage side of things and then maybe they've gotten into 
uh, more broker world as far as lending or real mm -hmm. estate in general. Yeah, to have an understanding, um, I think just like uh, you know, brokers or, or, or lenders that have a little bit of real estate experience, yeah. it can be it can be you know advantageous because then they kind of know what the other side's doing. That's a power going. Yeah, through. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. What would so, you say? I mean, I, I won't hold you to the stat, but on average, people that are buying a home, you know, average home buyer, how many of them are utilizing some sort of a loan? Oh yeah, I mean a like huge percentage. We're yeah. talking probably yeah. over ninety. Um, yeah, I mean I don't know about ninety. I mean, and obviously. Uh, Depends you know, on so, your price point. Yeah, I mean, some people just deal with cash buyers and they got <laughs> yeah. investors, right? So I guess their stats different. But you know, in any given year, my stats probably a little a little skewed as well. But yeah, a huge percentage of people, yeah. even if you have a massive down payment, you're using some type of financing sure, or some a lot type of, of creative leverage. way to buy. Yeah, yeah. even if somebody has the cash, then you know, sometimes the money just makes sense mm -hmm. from a mortgage standpoint. Maybe not so much now. With not so much now. Yeah, <laughs> this is the wrong time for that. Maybe we'll backdate this a little bit. <laughs> All right, so so did a little bit of banking. Yeah, your dad's building homes. You had a couple different jobs. At what point did you say, okay, did you ever want to build homes with your dad? Well, no, he was uh, he was he was working with a local builder um, uh, for a number of years. He retired. Um, oh, I think maybe twelve years ago. Um, you know, I just never. We talk about stuff all the time, but it was mm -hmm. never in the cards for me to really want to to go that path. I kind of think I just wanted to do my own thing. Sure. Um, and, you know, looking back, maybe it would have been a, a great opportunity um, to get into that world. But um, I think it was more about just experiences for me and what I wanted to kind of challenge myself with. Sure, yeah. sure. Now, you also own, or you at least you used to, I don't know if you still, you have a short-term rental? We do, north? yeah. Okay. Yeah. My wife, Shelby, and I, we we have a, um, a short-term rental up in Pine Top. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's something that we got into. Oh, in 2019. Um, Perfect and, timing. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, <laughs> that worked out. Um, you know, I, it's, yeah, people doing it, looking for it now, it's it's rough. But um, yeah. but yeah, we did have good timing. Um, it's been, you know, we, we feel pretty blessed about the timing and, you know, the times we've spent up there. We, we also use it when we can. Uh, but, but yeah, it's mainly a, a business um, type thing. And, um, and then Shelby also does some stuff locally in Gilbert. So, oh, cool. Yeah, she's got, she's got a property here that she manages too, so. So there's a lot of chatter right now about short-term rentals. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I've heard everything from, hey, you have to have a unicorn if you want to be successful. Right. I've heard that, no, it's just as good as it ever was. We're just right. not booked out three months. We're booked out three days. Right. So, I mean, what's your read on all this? No, great question. Um, it, it's it's 100% um, that I feel that it's it's been affected. I think that, you know, just like markets will have you know, investors flood to the market. And then, you know, if you're on the tail end of that, it's not a great opportunity for you because mm -hmm. um, everybody has been talking about it for so many years. And I feel like that's kind of what the short-term rental is right now, especially in places like Scottsdale um, and up north, even where we're at, it's very saturated. Um, you know, Sedona, all those places, Flagstaff, um, not that they can't be successful, but, you know, mm -hmm. if you buy in and you've got a mortgage and you've got all of this stuff to worry about, um, you've got to keep the door swinging. Yeah, you got to keep it. And so there's so many options now that people have um, that I think we're starting to see an influx of those on the market, especially here locally. Um, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, you know, the timing's not great. The weather's hot. Not, not a lot of people are coming here. So I think we're going to see a lot of sales in that regard. Um, you know, up north, I'm not seeing necessarily a ton of, of turns that are that are you know past short-term rentals it is happening but um people aren't just as booked as they used to be sure yeah it's definitely slowed down and we talk to other people that own them as well and it's the same for them i mean you know our, our other business red hog media we've shot quite a few yeah of course and and so you, it begs the question like will that make the adjustment yeah i don't know yeah like a lot of them are getting sold. Yeah. Now, whether they're getting repurchased by other people that want to do short-term rentals, yeah, and that's I have thing. no idea, yeah, right? That's the thing, right? That's, that's not our deal. That stays the same. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Just slide in. <laughs> but yeah, if it's, and, you it's know, being and, absorbed into yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, demand. sometimes people, you know, we've, we've seen also, you know, I work with clients up there. We've seen people that... Um, you know they're doing a 1031 exchange and they've got it they've got to find something oh, so yeah. they don't care that hey this isn't necessarily going to bring us a fortune we've just got to find mm -hmm. a spot to put this and this makes sense because we don't want to be in the valley we want to be you know get a mm -hmm. place up north or something so you know in situations like that maybe the numbers work better sure. than somebody going hey i'm going to use this as a second home and as a short-term rental and whoa what happened we're losing money every month this isn't what we thought we were getting into just because you know like we said the rates aren't great you know well i think the other thing that's 
hindering the industry or maybe just, I, I don't know what you would say, but the regulation side of it. Yeah, yeah so for sure. So Scottsdale's doing some interesting things. Right. In certain HOAs, even the one I live in here right in Gilbert, right. they don't allow. How they police it, I'm not really sure. I right. think they just go on to Airbnb and VRBO and yeah, for try sure. to look for the address right. and bust it. Yeah, and I think but, that I think that that's going to become... Uh, a huge issue as well, and not just maybe the cost or the success of the of the monthly income, but but the regulations obviously play into it. And you know, if you're buying something, you're rolling the dice on that. You know, mm -hmm. not just for HOA, but for local municipalities. Yeah, that might do something about it. You know, I think I think that's going to happen. It has happened. I think in a lot of places, you know, out of state, nationwide. Sure. Um, we haven't seen it as much around here, especially up north. But the conversation is is always coming up. You know? So that's what I was going to ask you, if you'd heard anything. Now, obviously, um, your short-term short -term rental is more rural. It's a cabin. Mm -hmm. uh, is that county or is it in a city? Well, it's in Pine Top. It's, in, yeah. it's actually yeah, in the in Pine city Top. proper? So, so, you know, the the uh, the nice thing about, you know, well, especially during sort of that COVID time and, you know, and, and, the, and, you know, obviously when it heats up here, a mm -hmm. majority of the people that go up to Pine Top Sholo coming from Tucson, yeah. coming from Phoenix, and it's, you know, it's a three, three and a half hour drive. That's a majority of the folks that come up. So sure. it's escaping the heat. And then in the winter, yeah. it's really contingent yeah. on the snow. Yeah. We oh, get snowstorms okay. and we'll get people to come up there and snowboard. We're 30 minutes from sunrise. Gotcha. So, okay. you know, we'll, we'll, It'll be, you know, December, January, yeah. and, or, you know, we, the holidays, we get a lot of, of, of interest, but, you know, it might be January 10th, and then all of a sudden we get, you know, sure. 10 inches of snow, and then boom, yeah, it gets rented sure. out. So That's so a that cool, happens. that's sunrise. We went there for the first time this last winter, and that's... Yeah really is a diamond in the rough. It is. Like, they've got some good fall lines. Yeah, they've got some good runs. It's kind of hidden. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's off the radar for most people because it's not by a big city. You can't mm -hmm. just fly into it and, yeah. you know, you got to drive. And so obviously Flagstaff gets a lot of that press for Arizona, Yeah, uh, but it's cheap, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's much less, you know, expensive and all around, you know, and then you can get an Airbnb or stay in Pine Top yeah. and drive, you know, 30, 45 minutes and yeah. you're there. So you don't really yeah. have to stay right there you know i wish they had more of a resort type yeah that would be property cool. that would be that's what cool. i was thinking the whole time i was up there yeah i'm like man this is a diamond in the rough it is yeah there's room for condos there's yeah. room for maybe a better restaurant right yeah <laughs> no. you, you don't like you don't, you don't like hot dogs and popcorn <laughs> <laughs> well i do actually <laughs> just not three days straight yeah 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 it's kind of but, rough well I, yeah anyway i could we could do a whole episode about yeah. the ski industry right but the reason why I was asking that is just because of the regulation piece. Yeah. Like, I don't know, have you heard of any um, regulations in Flagstaff or any of the little towns where they're going to you know, try I to haven't. put controls on that? Which is good news. Yeah, I haven't, you know, I, I have heard some stuff come down from Sedona. Okay. Um, you know, I had, I had some friends just talking about it. I don't know specifics, but I think that dealt with more of the construction because there was a lot of construction happening for the, the sheer purpose of renting okay. them out as short-term rentals. And so the construction was more in line with, hey, we're doing four bedroom, four bathroom type, sure, you know, places sure. that make sense. And so, uh, you know, I think that that I have some regulation on it or some stuff kind of coming down the, the wire, okay. but I don't know. No, yeah, you haven't heard anything, which yeah, is no yeah. news is good news. You, right. Okay, so let's talk about some fun mountaineering stuff. All right. How go. on earth did you, you know, growing up in the desert, right? how did you get into mountaineering? Yeah. How did this whole thing start? Well, um, you know, I've kind of always had that bug as far as um, just travel in general. Um, and then, you know, I didn't do a, a whole lot of hike, the extreme hiking or climbing when I was really young. I, we did the, I did the canyon with my dad and, you know, we went rafting and hiked out of the canyon when I was young and we did some crazy stuff. And um, I remember one time when I was 12, my dad got the idea of let's, let's, let's get these um, mountain bikes, you know, the big clunky mountain bikes back when we were young. And uh, let's let's ride to Payson from Mesa, you know, back when there was no shoulder and you know. Oh, geez. <laughs> so we did that. We made it to uh, to uh, oh shoot, where'd we make it to? I can't even remember now. Sunflower, and wow. it was you know middle of summer, good time to do it, you know. Oh my god. Yeah, we had saddlebags and everything. So wow. I think my dad probably has a little that maybe that passed down a little of the crazy. <laughs> um, but anyway, we uh, we 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 did a bunch of stuff like that. But then as I got older, I think um, you know it just sort of things just kind of this sparked an interest in me to like, what, what could I do to push myself? And I always kind of had 
you know, Mount Kilimanjaro on my radar is just kind of, I want to do that, you know, and I just never got it done, you know, you just work and stuff comes up. And so, uh, that was kind of the first thing, um, in 2014 that was a little bit bigger. I had done rim to rim. At the I was going to say, cause that was a big yeah. jump. So yeah. it really kind of started in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. The that's, Grand Canyon, cause that's a I mean, serious it's in backyard, you know, it's yeah. close. And so I'd done rim to rim, I think two or three times by then. Okay. Um, and you know, once in August, which was a bad idea. And then, you know, a couple other times when you're supposed to do it and, uh, you know, it's a long day, it's a hard day and it's kind of a challenge and it's kind of a bucket list thing for most people. And again, mm -hmm. it's one of those things you can say, okay, well, what am I going to do to stay in shape for the next six months. Well, let's okay. go do rim to rim, you know, cause okay. I gotta be in shape to do it. So I gotta get ready and I gotta prepare. So, um, so I'd done that a few times. And so then I started researching, you know, some other stuff. And again, Mount Kilimanjaro came up, didn't require any technical climbing, you know, no, no ice axes and you know, that kind of stuff. It's okay. I, I think I might have the skills to do this if I can just, you know, be ready for it. And How so, high is that mountain? Uh, Kilimanjaro is 19,341. So you need so oxygen. You don't No. You don't. You don't No. Um, wow. You know, uh, oxygen is usually, I mean, for mountaineers that are kind of above that, you know, that 24, 25,000 meters, really? you know, when you're up there for an extended amount of time. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I looked into that and, and uh, signed on with a company, um, just went by myself. Um, and, you know, there's a group of other people, of course, and just met some really great people that were kind of into the same thing. Um, my guide had climbed Everest and actually found Mallory's body. One of the guys that found Mallory's body back in. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so he was kind of a legend and just super modest guy. I didn't even know that until a year later that he had been involved in that. Um, and so uh, and, uh, Andy, for those... Pulitz, Andy Pulitz is his name. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so just kind of, you know, that was the sort of the initial, I love this stuff. You know, um, we, we had a great time, wow. went, on a, went on a safari, climbed, <laughs> climbed, you know, summited Kilimanjaro, just one of those things where, you know, I think everybody has that <coughs> in their life where you kind of go, I thought I couldn't do that for two or three years or forever. And then I did it. And now I'm like, what's next? You know, that, sure. was, that wasn't that bad. Let's do some more. And so, um, you know, I kind of just got involved in that and, and doing some more things. And then, uh, you know, as far as the the next big one, went over to Nepal in 2018, went up to, to Mount Everest Base Camp along with an expedition. And, you know, I wasn't there to, to summit Mount Everest. I okay. was there to go up to, to the to the base camp and spend a few days. And that was amazing. That was with the comp same company. Um, and then um, I met a handful of people that all summited Mount Everest and I still stay in touch with them. And, you know, there's just some crazy, amazing mountaineers and people that push themselves and, and, and have some really cool stories. So, uh, that was a great trip. And then kind of just got into it and really just started, um, networking with some great people that were in that industry. And I've got a, a great friend, his name's Adam Christie. And he was, he was at the time a guide with K2 Adventure Travel here locally. Okay. And this is, you know, fast forward a few years ago. Um, and he kind of, we'd always talk about stuff, you know, he had, he had done Canyon trips here locally and, um, in Arizona, they do the, the rim to rim trips and then they do international trips, you know, Nepal and Kilimanjaro and, um, you know, basically every mountain you can think of, they can put a custom trip together. Okay. Um, and so we, uh, we would always chat about stuff. We'd go hiking together. And then, you know, one time he kind of said, Hey, you know, uh, they asked me if, if I know anybody that might be interested in doing some guiding. Uh, you know, and I know you, you definitely are interested in it. And, you know, I think you'd be good with the, with the clients. And so, um, I met the owners and he said, yeah, let's, let's, you know, come on to our trip. We need you for October. And this is going back a few years. Um, so I went on a trip and I think the first trip we had like 20 clients and it was just me and one of the owners and, um, you know, and that was kind of my interview, you know, uh, but, but yeah, we really hit it off and it was just, I just felt like I was home, you know, this is something that I really love to do. Um, Cause it's a lot of fun. You're seeing people experience for the first time. That's yeah. something that you've done before. Yeah. You know exactly how they feel. Sure. Um, uh, you know, and a lot of people that go to the grand Canyon to do the rim to rim with us have never been there. Okay. You know, so they're, they're never even been to the, never grand, been Canyon. To the grand Canyon. So oh, wow. they, they, you know, they're flying in from another state and they've been training on a treadmill or something cause they live sure. you know, in the flatlands yeah. and they're coming and saying, wow, look at this massive, just super amazing thing. Yeah. And we're going to go, down down and, to the bottom yeah and then come back which yeah. like let's unpack that for yeah. a second because the going to the grand canyon just going to the bottom and back out yeah. let alone going rim to rim right. let alone going rim to rim to rim right i mean there's an elevation change sure. there's a lot of environmental factors right. it's easier to go down than it yeah. is to come back up yep. right yeah absolutely and the temperature change yeah there's nothing the, like it the, yeah. it's the, it's a trip right? yeah 
Yeah, you, you know, you have the south rim and is about 7,000 feet, and then the north rim is about, oh, 81, 8,200 feet. Oh. And then, you know, it's 2,000 feet or plus or minus at the, you know, at, at Phantom Ranch down at uh, the bottom of the canyon where the river's at. So, you know, you're going down quite a bit. You're going down a mile. You're going down in that box of the canyon where that Phantom Ranch stuff is, is is about the same temperature as the valley in most cases. So if it's 105 here and it's 40 degrees at the north rim when you start, it might be 105 at the bottom. And then you got to hike out and then, you know, you, you're going to lose, you're going to lose some, some degrees as you come up, but mm -hmm. you're also going up in elevation. So it's, it's amazing and, and re really hard for people to wrap their head around training for it because sure. first, like you said, you're going down first. So you're kind of, Hey, this isn't so bad. And, yeah. then, and then that second part of the day is you kind of, you know, that come to Jesus moment where you're <laughs> yeah. like, Oh my God, I'm going to get out of here. Well, and the, there's no, there's no helicopter, uh, yeah. hundred buck type thing. You know, yeah. people think there's always a rescue situation and that's not the case. In the no, game. there's no tram at no, the end of there's the no tram. Yeah. You got it. There's no unless elevator. You have a, unless you have a, uh, you know, uh, a really bad medical situation, you're not getting a free ride out of there. And it's not free, <laughs> even if it is a medical situation. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, we might as well do like a PSA on that note, like yeah. telling people, you know, hey, prepare. Give right. Your, a lot of people, I think, that get into that medical situation, they just don't allocate enough time. Sure. You know, they're like, oh, it's, it's noon, we'll go down. And then they go down, maybe they get to the bottom. Right. I don't know, what does it take if you couple hours to get to the bottom uh no more than that i mean you know and it depends uh, I mean, I mean, it depends on people's pace but we we do so we do it in a day so you okay. know our trips are three-day trips but that's transportation up and then you know we do the the actual hike one day and then transportation sure. or you know back yeah so, so you're going about 25 miles in one day that's okay down and up from okay. one rim to the next and as a crow flies, it's only about 10 miles. You can see it from the south rim sure. in binoculars. And then to drive, it's about four or five hours around. Sure. But that, that trail, and we do, we do, uh, we do the, the North Kaibab Trail down to Phantom Ranch and then uh, Bright Angel. Um, you know, when we do either south down to the river and up or, or, you know, when I've done rim to rim to rim, I'll do that South Kaibab Trail, which is a really pretty trail because you're on the ridge line, you can see the sunrise, you can nice. see almost the whole canyon. It's very, very cool. amazing. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's, that's the route we go. And there's, you know, it's, there's, that's where everybody's at, you know, sure. you're coming out where the lodges are at. So there's a lot of people on it. Um, but you know, if you're in the doing it in the middle of the night and, and you yeah. don't see a whole lot of people, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about, I would say our average is 12 to 16 hours for okay. most people. Okay. Um, you know, you can do it much quicker, um, sure. but most of our folks are, you know, seeing it, like I said, seeing it for the first time, they're taking it slow and taking photos and you know sure. we're doing rest breaks to make sure everybody's you know properly taken care of sure uh, so that's our average um, you're doing it the right way but to anyone who just like parks the car at nine in the morning with a fanny pack and two water bottles yeah and then they're like you know and then they're, oh let's go down and right. up real quick right. and, and they go all the way down or they get, maybe they get halfway down and they're like this is easy yeah let's keep going yeah and they go all the way to the bottom this right. is easy yep. and then they take their time and they take pictures and they have lunch right. and then it's like getting out yep is and, miserable and, and we see it all the time yeah, yeah we see it all the time you know when you're getting close sort of that to that south rim if you're a few miles from the top and you see people with flip-flops and jeans and you know, a little, little thing of water. You're like, eh, they're not, that they're not prepared for that turnaround, no. <laughs> you know, when they got to go out. So yeah, we see it quite a bit, but yeah. but yeah, obviously you, you know, you, you want to be prepared and you know, even the best, you know, some people that are, you know, ultra marathon runners get into bad situations mm -hmm. down there because it can turn on you and weather is a big factor. Weather is a huge factor yeah. that you can only do your best to prepare for, but right. can never control. Right. I tell my kids all the time, just going on silly little hikes. Yeah. Like, you know, just three weeks ago, we were 80 miles. No, we were 20 miles from the Canadian border at a lake with resorts and this and that. But I said, you know, you realize in a perfect situation, we're three hours from a hospital. Right. Like, just don't let the resorts and everything fool you. Right. But I know this area. Yeah. And, you know, it would have to be an emergency for them to even get an ambulance to us. Right. In two hours. Cause there's only one and if they're already on a call <laughs> you're next in yeah. line and you know them by first name right <laughs> that's right <laughs> and uh yeah and people just don't think about yeah. that you know they right. see the and all the expensive boats and the and they're not even hotels or like you know a lot of cabins and whatnot sure. i'm like yeah, yeah don't let this fool you no. we're in the middle of nowhere and a rolled ankle 
can become, you know, my daughter was running on the dock and she fell between a crack and the dock. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, I'm glad she didn't do it like a mid shaft femur. Yeah. You know, because she scuffed herself up really good, got yeah. really lucky. Yeah. But I mean, like, if you had busted your knee out, yeah. <clears throat> you know, and had some sort of compromised situation with right. blood flow or whatever, like, uh, yeah, we're, we're best case scenario, three hours from hospital. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a big part of, uh, you you kind of mentioned the Knowles stuff with wilderness first responder. That's yeah. you know that it's kind of the opposite of the way they teach their medicine, right? It's you know with with anything here urban, you know, it's like all right, we need to keep we need to keep this person alive for probably five minutes. You yeah, know, call nine one one. That's the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or you know if you're if you're at someone's yeah if you're if you're just calling nine one one, then maybe a minute, two minutes, yeah. hopefully, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's almost uh, the opposite of that. It's like okay, well. We're gonna have to. You're gonna. This could be three days. Yeah, we're know? cutting off some tree branches. Yeah. We're gonna make a splint. That's we're gonna right. apply traction yep. Yep. to your femur yep. and, and separate. Yeah, it. and hopefully all those things aren't on the same person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what was your Knowles experience like? And it's been so long since I looked into it. Yeah. Was that like a couple weeks or? So, uh, you know, they, they offer many classes. Uh, yeah. You know, the leadership uh, stuff. Um, you know, they're they're. Uh, they're international, so you can kind of take it anywhere, which is kind of cool. You know, that you is. can make a really cool vacation out of it. But I've done my stuff in Flagstaff. Um, it's okay. a good place to do it, obviously. Um, in the summer, you get out of the heat, you know, and mm -hmm. you do a lot of scenarios outside. So, okay. you know, I don't, you don't want to do it necessarily in, in the middle of summer, somewhere hot. But, um, but yeah, the initial certification for wilderness first responder is, I think, 11 days. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot of classroom you know, a lot, of, a lot of lecture and then a lot of scenarios. So you okay. go out there, you know, fake blood, mm -hmm. bone sticking out of this and that, train wreck, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. lots of scenarios uh, just to kind of get your mind right as far as doing the patient assessment. That's the big thing is, you know, you come upon somebody and you got to do that patient assessment, find out exactly what's going on with them because mm -hmm. there could be a number of factors. Sure. Um, so that was, so that was 11 days. And then we do a recertification every couple of years, okay. which is uh, like a three day thing. And that's, okay. and that's just kind of jumping right back into it. You sure. just kind of do scenarios and <clears throat> kind of maybe some, some more, um, expert level type stuff um, from what you know you've already sort of known and a lot of the people that do this you know you you come across a lot of people that are in you know in the in wilderness EMTs type jobs or, yeah guides guides mm -hmm. out you know river guides um you know a, a lot of people that work for the uh the parks a lot mm -hmm. of rangers that okay. are doing it like the last one we did we had a few park rangers from from grand canyon so so is it fair to say like the thousand yard view of Knowles? is it kind of like an emt course that's very specific so, to the environments that you're in. Well, National Outdoor Leadership. Um, so that it's it's um, they've got they've got a number of things. The the Wilderness First Responder Woofer is is what they call it. That's, Woofer. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was thinking yeah, too. Yeah. So that's that's what that's kind of what that's what I am is a Wilderness First Responder. All of our guides are. Okay. Um, and so you, it's required to be a guide um, okay. with with most all companies I would I assume and definitely with K two and um, that is is kind of the overview and. And also the very in-depth of what we're doing. You know, if you're in the canyon or if you're, you know, something in Kilimanjaro, you don't have medical attention. You know, you're going to have to figure stuff out. You're going to have to mm -hmm. improvise. And so it does a lot of that, um, you know. And you, you kind of deal with what you got, like making splints out of jackets and poles and yeah. this kind of stuff. So that's kind of what it's about. Um, the They also offer a full, like, EMT class Okay. Uh, that's up in their headquarters in, are in Wyoming, I believe. Okay. And they offer, uh, I think it's a month long and that's more, um, a, a, uh, EMT urban setting mixed with an EMT wilderness setting. So you're, you're, you're flying in on helicopters as part of your scenarios there. I mean, sure. And then you're, you're doing rotations in a hospital, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you're getting EMT old, on steroids. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because you're getting what the what the urban EMTs are getting, plus I think you know yeah. the wilderness setting. Which for me that might get a little bit because you know you're you're dealing with both. Yeah, and you know one is handled much differently than the other. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But but yeah, that is offered. I thought about that actually a while back, uh, just timing and and you know what you're dedicating to it. Um, and if you're not if you're not doing that as sort of your first profession. It's one of those things that, you know, you might do it and then you lose a lot of your skills if you're not. I was going to say, going. yeah, like I was a ski patroller all through the 90s and I recertified about eight years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, 
but then I moved to Arizona and stopped yeah. ski patrolling. And <laughs> I can attest, it is a perishable skill. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And one thing I never thought would ever happen, but the rules for CPR change too. And I'm like, what? How yes. does this happen? Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, and that happens. Rescue breaths, yeah, no longer. No, yep. It happens. It almost happens every few months, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 I guess ask anybody who's learned a language, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See how much they do it now, right? <clears throat> but I would say that, I mean, gosh. You know, it would be really cool if that was ever offered in like high school or something. Oh, because yeah. it's, it really is, it's it's more than just field craft. I mean, it's at the core of who we all are. Oh, yeah. Being able to just go for a walk in the woods and treat somebody with a sprained ankle. Right. And see a little bit of blood and not panic. Right. And identify a head injury. And, right. You know, and at least be able to make them comfortable. Right. Until a higher level of care yes. comes. That's kind of what first responders do, right? It is, 100%. Right? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, um, yeah, I mean, in the canyon, if somebody has a heart attack and you're doing CPR, the goal is to get them help. You're not going to have them, you know, no, you're not doing CPR for three yeah, hours. Yeah, you're not going to crack their chest yeah, open you're, and you're gonna, their heart. Yeah, you're going you're to keep them alive. And so the goal yeah. is to hand them off to somebody who can save their life. And yeah. if that means an aerovac and taking them 300 yards down the trail to where a helicopter can land, mm-hmm. that's kind of what you're doing. But... In a setting where you're in the backwoods for days, you know that heart attack victim's probably not going to make it. I mean, right. that's the simple right. truth to it. But, but yeah, 100 percent. You know, right after I did it, I I came across a car accident, and it was just like, whoa. You know, it was like that's. I mm-hmm. mean, even in the urban setting, you sort of had that mentality, and uh, you know, and and you yeah. can help. You know, and, yeah. I mean, everybody has that. I think inherently in them to help, but if mm-hmm. you don't know what to do. Then right, you don't want to help because yeah. you feel like you're going to do the wrong thing, exactly. and cost someone their life. Yeah, but if you feel like you have enough knowledge, at least, I mean, I think CPR at minimum mm-hmm. is something that any anybody should know, not just a parent or mm-hmm. you know whatever, just because it is simple to do. Yeah, and even if you do it in the wrong, you know, yeah, if you, you, you're, if you're, you can break a rib and still save just, somebody's life. You're doing fifty <laughs> percent of it right. You're probably going to be good. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but just, just you know, taking that step to actually initiate it, I think, is the key. Yeah. And if you have that knowledge of at least, hey, I took this class, I remember this, then I think that that's going to help you. You're reminding me that my CPR has expired. First thing I did when Lauren and I were engaged and found out we were having our first child, yeah. I, I said, Are you, yeah, let's get you CPR certified. Yeah. We had an EMP come to the house. Super easy. Yeah. Uh, he was actually a firefighter yeah. that didn't even wouldn't even accept payment he's like yeah oh, i'm gonna do cool. this for you guys that's you know cool. yeah so but so for anyone listening yeah, yeah understand cpr yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> i mean it's and we live in a big city so there's lots of different options i mean you, yeah. you know you could take it with all kinds of associations and stuff and not that we're um playing attorney or anything but there are good samaritan protections oh yeah like you know yeah. as long as you're not operating beyond your level of training um, but if you're certified to do CPR, you right. can do CPR. Yeah. No one's going to sue you. Yeah, no, no tricks with a big pen. But right, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing from the movies. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so um, you got to have some good stories hiking. Like that, you obviously I don't want you to disclose anyone's medical confidence. Right. But I mean, you've got to have some good stories. If nothing else, uh, the guide that found Mallory. Like I'm not familiar with that story. What yeah, well, happened? What so, was that? Well, you know, that was the that was sort of the story of whoever summited, you know, Everest first, you mm-hmm. know, and and that was uh, I'm I'm going to probably misquote the year, but like in the 20s or something, okay. you know, um, and and uh, he was they 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 weren't really sure if he summited or not, you know, he was with a Sherpa and and they they actually went out to find his climbing partner, a Sherpa that was with him, and they wound up finding him. Because somebody had said, "Hey, there's a body on Everest," you know, number of times, and so they pinpointed where it was at. Now that those rescue missions are a little bit more common, you know, you hear about Nims Die doing it with 14 summits, and you know that guy that's up there all the time. But, um, but yeah, so they kind of came across his body, and Conrad Anker, who's kind of known in the in the mountaineering world, he was a part of that as well. Um, but it's a cool story, um, you know. They they kind of thought they were finding the other guy, and they wound up finding Mallory's body. Um, and you know, it was basically by what they were wearing and then they sure. ID them in many sure. ways, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously people that have passed away on, on those big peaks and they're up there for a number of years and, you know, after a long time, you know, identifying them is, is pretty tough, but, uh, but yeah, I wasn't a part of that. Um, but yeah, sure. my, my guide was, and, and he's been through some pretty cool things. Um, but, 
I think most recently I had the, um, the chance to go on with K2 and we went to um, Tanzania last year. Okay. Um, and they had worked in partnership with Valley Wise Health um, here locally in the Arizona Burn Center, which um, they were raising funds for the new Burn Center, which is in construction now, and I think it's close to being completed. Um, but it's an amazing, amazing facility um, and amazing people um, that work there. Um, Dr. Foster and his team that work at Arizona Burn Center are just amazing people. And I wasn't really um, in the same group of folks until I, you know, kind of was started becoming a guide with K2. And they had originally planned in 2020 to do Kilimanjaro. They had worked with K2 to say, hey, we're going to raise money for this burn center. We've got people with Valley Wise and we're going to have eight burn victim survivors that have gone through the burn center uh, through Dr. Foster wow. and his colleagues care. And we're going to we're going to summit Mount Kilimanjaro. So they had started training and they really focused on their fundraising and their training and just amazing group of people. And obviously COVID happened. So it kind of put a curveball on everything. And so they became a really tight knit group because they had two years to plan for this. And so it finally arrived and we went last year and they had K2, Kristen and Kevin, the owners, they're not married. They're well, they're married, but not to each other. They started the both the, the K2 um, Adventure Foundation, which is a nonprofit, um, and they really work with uh, people with disabilities. Okay. Um, and then over in Tanzania, which is kind of their baby, they're just, they actually just got, or they're getting back, I think, today from Tanzania after multiple climbs. They've got a, um, they've got a prosthetic center that they just opened last year over there. There's a, an orphanage that I visited when I was over there. They've got, I think 12 kids that live there, um, that go to school and they pay for their tuition. Wow. Um, and then they do a lot for the school that's there. Um, uh, just, just amazing things that are going on over there. And so the foundation really feeds into a lot of those programs here locally as well. Um, okay. there's a golf tournament in September that we're doing, uh, but that, um, and then obviously the travel stuff that I'm more a part of. Uh, but we had, um, about 225 total people on the mountain with, with, what? you know, you had support, we had local guides, we had four guides from the U S including okay. myself. Um, uh, we had, I think close to 48 clients, including the, uh, the uh, survivors, um, and, uh, the medical staff from Valley wise. Um, and then some additional people came on the trip, you know, as well, but it was just an amazing experiment or experience. Um, sure. we, we you know, we just kind of grew as a, as, a, as a great big group. Um, and just to see what those folks went through. Um, and in addition to just the, the team of people we had, uh, they were doing a documentary film. Oh, really? And so they had hired, um, his name's David Pellegrini and he, uh, him and um, um, Justin, I forgot Justin's last name. Uh, but anyway, he, they, they, uh, they were doing a movie the whole time. And so these guys are running around and, you know, kudos to them. Cause I'm yeah. trying to go, Hey, slow down, you know, yeah, they're yeah. running around, you know, at 18,000 feet. <laughs> Do you know the name like, of the movie? Take some, yeah. So it's called, uh, it's called um, Courage Rising. Okay. And so we actually got to see it. Um, and so we had a, we had a premiere um, back in March, I believe. Um, and so it's amazing. It's an amazing documentary. Um, it goes through the stories of these, these individuals and then the story of the climb over there and wow. they all summited and I was, wow. and you know, I was blessed to be with them on that summit. You know, That's awesome. it was awesome. It was incredible. And that, that right there was probably, uh, the most memorable climbing, hiking, whatever story that I can, that I can think of just because, you know, from what they had to go through to, um, to that point, sure. it was just that culmination and the emotion that, that kind of came upon everybody. Sure. But, um, it was, it was pretty awesome, but yeah, it's called courage rising and everybody keeps asking me, where can I see it? When can I see it? And I wish I'd say, you know, I can send you the link, but I can't cause it's one of those things, you know, they're trying to shop it for, you know, a streaming type thing still. Okay. So we haven't heard anything. We got to see it in the theater. It was at Orpheum theater in downtown Phoenix. Which oh, wow. Is an incredible place. That's awesome. Yeah. It was really cool. So we got to see it all as just the climbers one the first night and then we got to bring family and then they sold tickets to fundraise. Um, and I think that over the last few years, um, alongside K2 and, and Valley Wise, um, they've raised something like $800,000 for this, for this burn center. It's just an amazing mountain. Wow, that's you know? great. And yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. But, but yeah, so that was just, you know, a memorable experience. Um, you know, and you know, it's one of those things where you're kind of, you know, you're climbing, you're like, oh, you know, my ankle kind of hurts today or, you know, whatever. And then you're look, you're looking at somebody who can't even control their body temperature because they've got burns, you know, that they're, yeah, they've got skin grafts. Yeah. yeah. So 
I mean, you just, it really puts everything kind of, you know, in yeah, yeah. perspective, but, but it was an amazing experience. Um, that right there is going to be hard to top, you know, just, just something like that. But those are the types of things that I've been able to be involved in with that community. It's not just, yeah. it's not just, Hey, we're going to go climb a mountain and then, you know, take some pictures or whatever. It's right. like the experience, the people you meet, uh, every Canyon trip I meet, you know, I, or I go on, I meet just some amazing people that usually from, you know, other states, yep. you know, um, usually people come out of state, out of country to come do this. And yeah. so you want to make that the best experience for them. Yeah. Uh, Cause they're going to remember it forever. You know, it's a yes. huge bucket list item. So you're, I mean, that's how I got that name common connection. Yeah. It was really yeah. just yeah, was, awesome. you know, all the fun things that you do in life, work, it always boils down to, I mean, obviously when you're in nature, you're connecting with nature, uh, but you're always connecting with people. Yeah. Like that's always the best part yeah. is who you surround yourself with yeah. and making those memories. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. 30 years from now, you may not remember exactly what car you drove in 2019, right. but you'll remember the trips yeah, or, right. you know, and some of those experiences. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Have you ever been involved in a medical situation on a, on a mountain? Do yeah, you know? we, um, you know, we've had some situations, um, you know, you don't, you deal with different things. Um, you know, with the Canyon, we deal with a lot of heat exhaustion, heat stroke, um, yeah. you know, occasionally, you know, a little bit further that leading to heat stroke. Um, especially, you know, with folks that are just not used to this climate. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do, we do, we deal with that probably the most. Um, you'll have some sprained ankles here and there. And, um, we've, we've been a part of, um, different rescue type things, but not with our group on, on a couple of occasions. Um, and, and the folks at K2 obviously have seen all kinds of stuff, the owners, you know, over the years. Um, so they've got probably more stories than, than I've got, but, um, but yeah, we, we, we usually see heat stuff with the Canyon. Um, uh, as far as, you know, your, your bigger mountains, you see more of the altitude sickness stuff, mm. you know, and that, that comes into play a lot because you really have to monitor that. Everybody reacts differently to the altitude and the Kilimanjaro trip's great because the, it's a seven day trip and yeah. acclimatization is a big part of that reason why, yeah. you know, um, you don't want to just race up, but you know, you take it slow, mm -hmm. go high, sleep lower, you know, um, and so they've got it down to a science and, you know, our success rate of people summiting is very high yeah. um, because of that, you know, because you want to take it slow. You want to make sure everybody is, you know, is doing what they need to do mm -hmm. and, um, and they're going to be successful. So, so I've only been mountaineering once mm -hmm. my entire life. Yeah. I was in college. Yeah. Uh, I was going to the university of Idaho. They had a rec program okay. like, yeah, let's go up to Canada. We went up to British Columbia okay. to actually Kokanee Glacier. If you've ever had the beer. I think they sell it down here now. Okay. They used to sell, it's a It's a very, it's like Coors in Canada. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, you either drink Molson or you drink Kokanee, yeah. depending on what province you live in. <laughs> right. So anyway, we go to Kokanee Glacier. This is embarrassing to admit, but I will just, I will just take the sword here. So this glacier, uh, we base camped at, uh, I want to say like 7,000 feet. Okay. And I, the top of the mountain was maybe uh, everything up there is in meters, but I think it was like just shy of 9,000 feet. Okay. Not high at all, but you know, a bunch of college kids. But if there's a glacier, it's a different story, right? Right. Yeah. And, uh, well, so it's the middle of summer. Yeah. Uh, it was 85 degrees and we stepped out of the, out of the van and our parking lot that was at 3,500 feet. Right. And uh, so, you know, wearing a pair of, I'll never forget it, Grimichi shorts and a t-shirt. And I had probably about 75 pounds of all our gear, you know, the crampons, the boots, right. the, all the, all the stuff, tent, food. Yeah. And of course, beer, because we're yeah. in college. So we had to pack yeah. beer. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, there may have been some day drinking on the bus on yeah. the way up. Yeah, hey, hey, you got to do it. So, yeah, it just gets, it just gets smarter. <laughs> so <laughs> All the right decisions. <laughs> all making the right. all the right yeah. decisions. Yeah. I, I'll never forget, we had to put chicken wire around our van because the marmots would eat our brake line cables. <laughs> have you ever had that experience? <laughs> no. Yeah, it was the craziest thing. Where we were at, the guy I had was, a boxer that ate everything, but not yeah. marmots. <laughs> no, it was like uh, marmots... Uh, I believe it was marmots. Yeah. And uh, he's like, yeah, they, yeah, no, they are. They Canada. will, yeah. they will absolutely chew yeah, on your brake lines. They, there's yeah. some smell that attracts them and they just think your brake lines are gummy bears. And yeah. You'll, you'll go to hit the brakes and you won't have any. Yeah. That's a horrible. horrible yeah. Way so we put the chicken wire around our van and we start hiking up and, you know, uh, 
you know, not drinking enough water. Yeah. That was the moral of this whole story is right. I was not drinking enough water right. and uh, made it to the base camp and miserable. I had the worst indigestion. My heart was pounding and I had a headache. I thought my brain was going to explode yeah. out of my eardrum. Yeah. I was destroyed. Yeah. And uh, there wasn't a hangover. Like yeah. I was sober on the entire. Right. It feels the, like an immediate hangover, right? It, yeah. But I mean, the indigestion yeah. was really weird, right? And my heartbeat was racy and thready, and yeah. and uh, I'm like, I just, I, sorry guys, I'm like I'm not gonna make it up tonight. So I, I did some stuff the next day, yeah. Um, but yeah, the first day I didn't do anything. I literally was in my tent for 24 hours. Yeah. Just, so I guess the moral of the story, 8,000 feet, and I had altitude symptoms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just because I wasn't taking yeah. care of myself. And it happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, even. Even going up to, to northern Arizona and Flagstaff, you know, if somebody just gets up at four in the morning and thinks they're going to go climb Mount, you know, to Humphreys Peak, mm -hmm. which is 12,000, yeah, 12,600 12, feet, you know, and yeah. you're coming from 1,600 feet down here. Yeah, no acclimation. Here, yeah, and you drive up there and just hit the trail, you're going to experience some some stuff, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not used to it. And there's a small percentage of people that don't, but a majority of the, the population experiences some type of altitude sickness. some people are more sensitive to it too yeah, and it probably sure. is you know maybe a genetics but also how good a shape you're in but yeah. i mean uh you know i lived in lake tahoe for a winter yeah and i was from coeur d'alene which is 2,000 feet yeah so i moved to lake tahoe and ski instructed i never felt comfortable up there yeah the entire time i was living in a house in south shore 6,000 feet yeah but every day we'd go up and ski at you know whatever the top of heavenly is maybe right. 12. yeah pretty far up there, um, yeah but uh but i mean that's just for the day mm -hmm. coming back down and i always felt out of breath yeah the whole time i lived up there yeah unless i was sleeping <laughs> <laughs> and at total rest but right. during the day when i was moving yeah i always felt out of breath yeah. and i was in pretty good shape yeah yeah but i was drinking a lot of beer in that well yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. There's times, you know, you hear about, you know, the best mountaineers in the world that, you know, experience stuff occasionally that, that they just don't know is coming on. You really? Know? So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a human thing that just happens. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you can be prepared and you can get into a situation where it's just a bad day. What's your training regime look like? Um, it depends. Um, you know, for the canyon stuff, I just do a lot of hiking around here because it really mirrors that. Obviously, it's not down and up, but... The desert, the heat, all those things that I'm going to be wanting to be ready for. Mm -hmm. You don't have really enough um, altitude at the canyon to, for it to really bother you, unless you're just from sea level and you're, it yeah, might affect you on yeah, the way out. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, and then if I'm doing something with a little bit more altitude, I try to get some stuff in. You know, I'll I'll, I'll go up to Flagstaff, I'll go up to Pine Top, and try to get some altitude in there with some hikes. Man, um, I never thought about it, but Arizona really is like a perfect state for yeah, training. Yeah, it really is. It's great. It's better than yeah. Colorado yeah, because you have great. extreme heat and extreme altitude yep. two hours from yeah. each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you it's can pretty... go up. Yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, do some you know Olympic training type stuff, a lot of ultra marathoners and flag staff just for that very reason. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so you know, I usually try to do a lot of that stuff. Um, you know. You're, you're, you're needing to get your, your lungs right, you know, your legs right, okay. all that stuff, your heart right. And that's, you know, you got you mix it up. It usually helps for me. Do a little bit of running, but mostly hiking. And you know, there's nothing that duplicates hiking, right? You know, stepping mm -hmm. weird and getting these muscles involved and all right, that. So, right, right, right. So you got to get out there and do that. You can't just live on a treadmill. Can't do it on the treadmill, yeah. yeah. But, um, but, yeah, so I try to mix it up. Um, and everybody's different. You know, some people can... You know, train for two weeks and then they're golden and other people train for you know six months right. and they're still struggling so you know <laughs> yeah. it just it just depends on the person on your person yeah yeah and the age you know and all that all these factors come into play are you opinionated about what type of boots and footwear you use like do you have some brands that you're I'm really... very opinionated for myself yeah <laughs> but but um but not for everybody else you know um for me, I, you know, I, I, I like to have something that uh, it's got a lot of padding, it's comfortable and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, some people just use trail shoes for the canyon. Trail shoes are good for the canyon. It's not a lot of, you're not doing a lot of, you know, weird bouldering or anything like that. There's mm -hmm. some weird steps and stuff, but uh, a lot of people wear trail shoes of some sort, but um, I kind of mix it up, you know, you, everything gets, you know, pushed out as far as different brands and everything. So you got to move sure. on to the new thing that's out, but yeah, but yeah. 
So you do like more of a hiking boot then? I do. It's a yeah. really, it's kind of, it's between like a, a trail running shoe and a, and a hiking boot. Okay. Um, I've all either, I've done some Solomons in the past and then sure. I've done Hoka has some, a lot of good, oh. yeah, they've got some hiking stuff out now that's really light. And really oh, padded. wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I've they, used their shoes for hiking. Right. And, yeah. Uh, so, so they, they, they make quite a few things now and you know, when they first came out, everybody's kind of, kind of more like one of these moon boots, right? I know. And now I know. everybody loves them. I know. You put them on, you're like, oh, I love these things. I know. Um, I've got some friends that are just like, yeah, you look, you know, you look silly. And then they're like, well, I'm going to try these now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so those are great. Um, you know, they make some hiking stuff. Um, ultras are really popular. Okay. Um, you know, they, they, they're really, um, they've got, you know, all kinds of models. So they're really popular on the trails. But, you know, it just depends. And then obviously if you're going to some higher climate type stuff, um, you got some mountaineering boots, you know, some almost sure. like ski boots, right. you know, stuff like that. Crampon. Yeah. Compatible. Exactly. So what about food? Like when you're training and then when you're hiking. So obviously you're looking at few, food as fuel. It's a different yeah. relationship. Yeah. So like when you're training, tell me about how, how you're eating then. Are you intermittent fasting? What, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And then when you actually go hiking, what are your go-tos? What do you like to just have max energy, low yeah. weight? Um, so I, uh, you know, like for, for training, I, I eat, I eat fairly healthy. I make food at home a lot. So I eat fairly healthy. I'll make breakfast at, at, at my house in the mornings. And, uh, usually before I go out for training, um, you know, I think everybody's kind of felt that wall where, whether you're running or hiking or whatever. And mm -hmm. I, I eat constantly when I'm out hiking, just, keeping the fuel going, oh, especially really? when okay. it's hot. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm not eating like, you know, cheeseburgers out on the trail or anything, but you know, I'm eating, um, you know, peanut butter sandwiches, crackers, you know, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of phased out of the whole energy bar stuff after you eat them for a number of trips, you just can't even look at all of those. Yeah. Anymore, so it's, just, <laughs> I, I've almost gone back to just real food. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I kind of mix it up. Um, you know, when, when when us and the guides, we do the canyon trips, it's kind of like you know, we stop at the grocery store in Flagstaff and we kind of look around. We're like, what are we going to do? You know, what's, what are we going to do this time? You know, let's, yeah. let's mix it up. Sure. Um, but yeah, just, just kind of just kind of keeping it going. But yeah, I, I definitely am constantly eating. And then, you know, like the the little cliff gel things or whatever, you know, the uh, box or whatever I use yeah. a lot. Um, okay. And and just, you know, a lot of, so, you know, we, we're really big, especially for people coming to the heat that aren't used to it. For the canyon, you got to have you know both electrolytes, salt tabs, water, just a mixture, okay. and whatever's right for them. But you know, sometimes people just don't think they need they need it, and then you know they hit that wall, and then it's hard to come back from. So you know, yeah. you got it. You got to hydrate. You got to stay well fed. And I'm definitely one of those people because mm -hmm. if I don't just keep eating, you know, yeah, yeah. Kristen with K2 is always like, you're always eating. And I'm like, I got it. I'm just like popping yeah. crackers in, you know, That's cool. walking. Yeah. But it's always a good morale booster too, like to have that one token meal oh, for yeah. certain people yeah. where like maybe you just say, okay, we're going to forego the extra weight here and we're going to pack something fun. Right. Yeah. If you can, yeah, I yeah, realize sure. that's, you know, when you're on yeah. Mount Everest, that's probably not <laughs> right. doable. Yeah. I mean, in the, yeah. In those places, I mean, it's all, it's definitely, the food's a big deal. Like with Kilimanjaro. You know, the, the, the cooks just make some amazing soups and food. Really? I mean, it's good stuff, you know. And sometimes you're just like, how did you, where's the, you know, I know yeah. where the kitchen is and it's that little tent. <laughs> yeah. How'd you make this? You know, how'd you make a cake for someone's birthday? You know, it happens. So, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, those guys are, these guys are amazing with what, they, what they're using. But, yeah, so, I mean, you eat really well on our trips wherever we're going. Uh, and the Kilimanjaro trips are no different, you know, and you have... Um, they're one of the few companies that uh, we, well, they'll set up tents and we actually set up for lunch. It's not just like a box lunch. So, you know, you're, you're, you're hiking half the day and then you mm -hmm. go in a tent and get some, you know, hot liquids and teas and coffees and, you know, whatever juice you want. And then you have a full on meal. So that's yeah, cool. you got to constantly eat. Yeah. What would be, so we're going to pivot a little bit, Yeah. but I got to ask this before I get, forget. And I know you talked about the, the movie crew that you assisted yeah. that project. Well, yeah, I didn't assist their, their movie making, but I was, you, yeah, you know, yeah. I was on the trip. Yeah. You're on the trip. Yeah. Um, but what was, if, if you can pinpoint <clears throat> your favorite, most memorable trip? Oh, geez. Um, I mean, that's, that's up there. That's for mm -hmm. sure up there. Um, you know, um, I would say not even from a, from a standpoint of, of the, of the sort of adventure mountaineering type, uh, climb type stuff, but 
my wife and I, um, Shelby, we, uh, we went to New Zealand in 2017 and we were there for three weeks and we, we hopped on a bus, hop off bus, you know, type situation. And so we went to the, the North Island, the South Island. We went skydiving over a glacier and, you know, we got to helicopter into another glacier and very cool. over that. And we went, um, you know, zip lining in caves and, you know, like glow worm caves and, you know, all this, just, just every adventure type thing you can pack into one trip. We did it on that, that trip. It. Yeah. And it was like, you know, it was affordable because it was New Zealand dollars and, you know, everything is so relaxed there. It's like, you know, so you're about to jump out of a 17,000 foot plane uh, signed here. And it was like, you know, one sentence. It was yeah. U.S. you'd be like, <laughs> yeah. so it's just, you know, it's just, they don't, it's very adventurous there, you know, you know for whitewater rafting or whatever, you know, yeah. yeah, someone died yesterday, but we're good. Yeah, yeah we're good. good. We're good. We're good. You'll be fine. So I imagine you're the kind of guy that proposed on something exotic. Like, <laughs> did you have I didn't, a... I, it wasn't exotic. It was on a hike actually. Okay. Uh, yeah. But it was here locally. Um, but it was talk, on a hike. At it least. was a hike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was it in the backyard no. by the barbecue? Yeah. It's, a, it's a hike to Circle K. <laughs> yeah. No, it was. Yeah, it was more of an impromptu kind of thing. So yeah, That's it was cool. here locally. But yeah, we've we've been able to take some really cool um, trips, and I think that. Yeah, that's part of the the thing that we love about each other is like you know I always think of the the madness and she's always game to do it. Yeah. So that's that's kind of it goes hand in hand. But yeah, we we had a lot of fun on that trip. But yeah, that was an amazing place, and I couldn't say it. Enough. You know, I, every time I see a flight deal come across my email for New Zealand, I'm always tempted just because it's such a such an amazing place. That's awesome. Yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Now, okay, so that's one of your most amazing trips. Do you have a specific memorable moment that could have been on any trip? Like, you know, maybe you watched somebody propose or maybe, you know, did you have like a, a moment that was like an amazing moment that you witnessed or were part of? Yeah, um, you know, um, I'm sure I have a lot, but you know, the one that comes to the top of my head is the is the one that I was on last year in, in Kilimanjaro and um, just to, you know, you know, you're there, you're with these people for, you know, probably a total of 10 days before you're at, you know, at the summit, and, you know, and, you know, on the trip and then, you know, day seven or so you're on the summit and just to see everyone, you know, make it to the top and then just the tears flow and then look at each other after three years of training for this very moment, um, was pretty amazing to, to kind of witness, you know, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And just, you know, they all sit up there in front of the, the you know the famous sign and took their photos and had their banners and just you know um it's pretty cool pretty what's cool. the bond like with the people that you go on those trips with like are you meeting each other for the first time on the trip you know usually we are we know yeah. we, we have so we had we usually have zoom calls um with with pre-planning trips pre-planning um but you know you're not having conversations you know it's just an overview and people have questions and you know yeah somebody will answer calming them. anxieties getting yeah. logistics yeah, gear what kind of stuff gear you yeah a lot of gear questions yeah and we're doing one actually tonight for the grand canyon oh fun it's coming up so uh, but yeah and you know people are coming from all over the united states and sometimes from out of the country so zoom yeah. just works you know sure um but uh so you know but but you know, you might see someone's face, but a lot of times you, you're meeting them for the first time, you know, and you either, mm -hmm. you know, meet them at headquarters here in Scottsdale or we will go pick them up somewhere. And, um, or, you know, if it's for an international trip, you'll be meeting them over at the airport in Kilimanjaro, you know? And, um, and so for that, yeah, I mean, so from yeah. the, the bond that happens is, is it's almost, you know, it's immediate because, you know, I, you know, especially for me, the first time I was doing these things and not even guiding, is like, okay, I'm gonna spend the next whatever with these people. Mm -hmm. And you start just like learning about them and where they're from and their background. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, on a very smaller scale of, you know, going through some crazy tough things together, you yeah. all kind of have that common thread yeah. of, all right, well, that sucked, you know, but, you know, we got through it kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, you stay in touch with people after you get back to, to daily life. And usually, it, you know, you're using in different states, but I'm still Facebook friends with people that I did, you know, Kilimanjaro with in 2014. That's what I was going to yeah, ask is that know, connection. Yeah, you know, I still shoot messages. Still like, you sticks. Know, hey, you know, like a few of them have kids now that, yeah. you know, are young and, you know, out of school and just had a job. You know, so it's just, it's cool to see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's cool to see this, you know, people go through their lives and, you know, you, you still feel like you, you know them even though you haven't seen them in you yep. know, 10 years. Yeah, you keep that connection. Yeah, that connection. That, it's so cool because, you know, I've been on nothing like what you've done, but I mean, I've, I've been on extended trips. 
hiking and rafting and you know whatever and those memories and those connections that you make with people like it's so real and it's so i think in, and i never experienced it again until i was in the military yeah because it's an inv which you know you always talk about your military buddies it's actually very akin to that yeah. because you're in an environment where okay we've made the decision to be here yeah. so we're here yeah <laughs> <laughs> right. And there's no... So, oh, so we I'm have gonna, that in common. Yeah, right. So it's like, it's not like, okay, I'm going to leave at five and I'll see you tomorrow. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> right. You know, so you're stuck with each other. Yeah. Electronics are stripped away. Distractions yeah. are stripped. There's no TV. There's no yeah. this, that, and the other. Um, certainly in military training too, right? Where oh, they yeah. strip away all your life. Oh, I'm sure. And, uh, but I mean, in, in your scenarios, it's the best of both worlds because right. all those negative things are stripped away. Right. But you're allowed to talk. Yeah, and you're allowed to. <laughs> right. You're allowed to socialize. We that usually. Yeah, <laughs> you're not just pushing, doing push-ups <laughs> yeah. and getting screamed at. So it's the best of both worlds. You're able to really form yeah. those connections. Right. You're relying on each other. Right. It's a teamwork. Right. You know, this person's carrying the, you know, the the food and this. Yeah. Everyone's carrying a little bit of everything, yeah. but I would imagine there's a disbursement of gear. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody handles it. Uh, you know, handles their own stuff and, you know, you, you kind of split up the, the work and yeah. And, you know, from a standpoint of just, I think, you know, like you're saying, you know, the beginning of that, of that story is, okay, you got, you both agreed to do the same thing. And that's kind of, that's, that's probably the only similar similarity to military, yeah. I think. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you, you have a common thread with the people that are on these trips that like, Hey, we enjoy this. Other people think we're crazy, but we mm. both enjoy this and we're going to, see this through and hopefully succeed in some yeah. or whatever we're doing. And, and then, you know, the great thing that I've really kind of loved about doing these things is someone's always done something crazier. You know, it's like, I always meet somebody that, you know, it's like, Oh, cool. Hey, so, uh, you know, uh, so what have you done? And it's like, well, I did, you know, I've summited Everest last year and then, you know, we went to K2 and some of that. And it's just like, you know, I mean, these people yeah. that you meet just in happenstance, you know, either on a trip or, at an airport or sure. whatever. I've done 3,000 base jumps off a yeah, cliff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when you, when you meet somebody that's done- I like wingsuit yeah, flying. Yeah, yeah, you're like, oh, okay, well, I had a, right. yeah. yeah, you're like, uh. I guess my mountain biking isn't yeah. so exciting to you anymore. I'll just sit right here and be you ran quiet. ran three miles this morning. Yeah, yeah, you just, you know, you it, it's, it definitely grounds you because, yeah. you know, you realize that stuff. Because, you know, everybody can turn the TV on and see these crazy trips and that. But then to meet these people yeah. in person, and then become friends with them and then they're like yeah i'm training for k2 last year we couldn't you know we got turned back and we're gonna i'm gonna go climb k2 this year and it's like you know yeah one out of four people that summit that die you know it's like so i mean you know like it, these are amazing feats that people are doing mm -hmm. and you know uh kristen uh the owner one of the co-owner of k2 they just like i said they're coming back and uh she just celebrated her 25th summit of kilimanjaro wow and uh, the, the park over there said that she's the only um, American woman to ever do 25 summits for, wow. as far as their records go. And so something like that is just like, that's you know, cool. So it's like, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm hanging out with these people on a daily basis and we're making jokes and going on these trips and having a yeah. good time. And the things they've done in their life are just, you know, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. And, you know, it's, it's always something to sort of strive to if it's, it's what you want to do. Right. Yeah. You can talk to those people. Hey, so you did that, you know, a couple of years ago. Let me let me pick yeah. your brain on that. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's a cool it's a cool world that that uh, exists I've always, out there. I've always been curious. So, what are the base camps like? This is a weird question, I know, but yeah. so I've always heard that you know base camp at Everest is 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 a interesting vibe, and I don't know if Kilimanjaro if that has a base camp, um, what that is like when people are waiting for their opening with the weather or whatever. Yeah, and then I you know and then so now back to Everest. I've also heard, and I don't know if this is urban legend or if it's not as bad as people think, or maybe it's worse than people say, but the, along the ascent, um, there's oxygen tanks and litter and dead bodies, and you're literally sure. stepping over all this carnage of dead people and oxygen tanks yeah. to get to the top and back. Right. Like, is there anything to that? Well, as far as getting into like the death zone and all that stuff with your oxygen tanks and, and usually where people lose their lives on a mountain like Everest, I haven't been that high. So I, I, I mean, I haven't seen it myself, but yeah, I, you know, I've talked to people that have, um, and it's a thing. I mean, there's definitely groups like uh, Nims Dai and other Sherpa from, from Nepal that have 
formed groups that have gone up and recovered bodies, um, hauled away trash. And in the past, you know, up to very recent times, uh, you know, you're taking your life and, you know, your life's in danger to try to rescue people up there because you're right. just trying to stay alive. Right. Um, you know, when you get up that high into what they call the death zone. And, and so that's, I think, very much a thing on Everest. Um, as far as, as far as base camps and all of that, Everest base camp is, is you know, when it's climbing season, uh, which we just came out of, you know, um, end of May is the end of, of, of coming in from the Nepal side. Okay. Um, the permits are only through the end of May. So that's why, I mean, that's a huge ma majority of the reason why you see those huge lines on Everest is because, you know, you have a very small window of weather for the most part and everybody's trying to get that little window. Yeah, so and then have, throw in weather. You throw in weather. So like when you have maybe three days of good weather and you've got hundreds of climbers, um, but the funny thing about this year is actually it's a huge difference in in um, permits for women worldwide compared to men. And I'm not talking like, you know, 60 to 50. Like, it's like 8 to 1 or something crazy. I mean, it was we, we saw the numbers. Um, I was looking at it with another guide. And uh, not just the U.S., but every country had more women that had gotten permits. So, I mean, it's not just a you know, a rich American dude's sport, you know, that they think nobody knows how to climb. I think, yeah. you know, it's definitely become a different sport, hmm. um, both from the U.S. standpoint and internationally. And you've got countries that, you know, traditionally wouldn't allow women to do things like that that were under, you know, various political regimes sure. that have started climbing. And it's just, it's, it's really cool, especially over in Nepal. I think that's become, you know, such a thing because Everest is what it is. Um, but... As far as base camp, it's a little city, you know, during the climbing season, you've got different companies. So, you know, you'll have a climbing group like International Mountain Guides or, you know, or K2 or whoever, you know, sets up shop and they've got, you know, their their food tent and they've got, you know, their tents around. So That's they kind cool. of all go to the same place every year sure. if they've been there for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, but it's a pretty long stretch right before the, the ice fall. And the ice fall is the dangerous part of that. Right? Okay. That's where you see all the, you know, the, the stuff that goes down if there's a earthquake or an avalanche and that's where a lot of people lose their lives because that ice is always melting and moving mm -hmm. and so those big seracs can fall and cause a lot of damage and so wow. that's that's kind of that's kind of the, the scary part about that um you know uh, kevin who is like i said one of the guys or one excuse me one of the owners of k2 he actually summited everest um a few years back um and he went from the north side from the tibet side from the china side and they don't grant as many permits um, but it's a more technical climb, but you're going, you're not going through that ice fall and it's, it's less busy. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you just have to deal with China. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's harder to do the permits. Right. Um, and also, yeah, it's, it's a more technical climb in the sense of it's more exposed probably. Okay. You know? But, um, but yeah, so, I mean, you can do it, do it from either side, but, but yeah, the base camp is, it's a really cool place to, I've, I've talked to people that have gone in like the fall and it's just, you know, there's nobody there because you know no one's climbing no one's attempting to summit so you you can see it and kind of turn around and go back hmm. um but you can trek through the himalayas and you know the himalayas are amazing because you'll see these big mountains and you say hey, what's that one and like i don't know you know it's like right it's like a hill here you know right it's, it's nothing it's 20 it's that's twenty one thousand feet you know it's nothing yeah you know, it's, that's wild that's small so Jeez. yeah it's it's pretty cool to, to trek through there and what's it like working with sherpas Oh, well, they're just amazing. I mean, you, I mean, I think everybody thinks that Sherpa just, you know, they, they always equate the Sherpa, especially um, to... Not even like a human being. Like, they're just, well, they, you know, you know robotic. They, they, yeah, they, you know, they equate that to, you know, just carrying stuff. And that's, you know, there's there's porters and people that do that, you know. And, yeah, you'll see somebody walk by with a, you know, a 400-pound door on their back, you know, roped around and just... Yeah, the, it's amazing. But, uh, but you know, we had some amazing Sherpa, which are just you know, very good guides, you know, so your Sherpa are guides over there. You right. Know, they've, they, they're usually from villages in that area. They're familiar with the area. They're, uh, I remember one, one experience, you know, I was at base camp and this is in 2018 and it's during the climbing season. And so people are going through the rotations of climbing up to, you know, camp one, camp two, camp three, mm -hmm. and so on to, 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 you know, get their training and before they're going to make their summit push. And so I was there during some of that. Um, and I remember hearing you know i was asleep trying to get some sleep and it was like 2 or 3 a.m and i hear like 30 sherpa walk by my tent and and they were like chanting and singing and they were going to like they were going to fix rope 
for the through the ice field for people through their for their training. So it's like wow, were, yeah, and they were, and they're 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 taken care of um, very well through certain companies. It gets a bad name because there are certain companies um, that you know don't have the experience to be over there. They shouldn't be over there. You know, and and they 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 take people for granted. They don't treat them right. They don't pay them right. But there are a lot of good climbing companies that take care of people, um, and and take care of families and develop you know climbing schools over there and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but they're they're just, I mean just some amazing people. I mean That's they're cool. they're up there doing that stuff, putting in the work, and you know obviously it's still not an easy task to to climb it. But you have the help of of all those things that are people are setting you up for success. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Man, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, well, um, how do people find you? If they want to use you, let's start with real estate. How do <laughs> oh, yeah. Pe- oh, yeah, real estate. Yeah, how do people find you as a realtor? Um, let's see here. Um, Josh AZ Realty is my um, Instagram. Okay. Um, email josh at joshunderwood.com. Okay, um, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. Um, and then uh, Facebook is josh.m.underwood, I think. Perfect. Yeah, so. Yeah, so then, if you're wanting to buy or sell real estate, here in the Phoenix area, yeah, this is the guy. Yeah, he's your guide. He's your I'll real guide estate you, guide. guide I like, I like what you did there. <laughs> yeah, and then the Airbnb too. We have as, as yeah. far as you know, people can reach out if they wanted to. I still haven't gotten my time. butt up there yet. Yeah, we. You need uh, to. I need to for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a nice little escape. Yeah, especially right now. Yeah, I need. Uh, do you just what's the? Do you have like a name for yeah, it on so, Airbnb? Uh, what's so the name? it's uh, foresteduretreat.com. We have there. It website. is. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Forest Edge Retreat. Now, if somebody wants to have you as their guide in the woods or yeah. the mountain or yeah. Grand Canyon. Yeah, yeah absolutely. How do um, they do that? Yeah, so K2 Adventure Travel. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, you can Google it. You can see all of our trips. Um, you can, you, you know, check out all the places we go, um, schedule. Um, if you say, hey, you know, it looks like it's all sold out, uh, we can we can create private trips. If, you, if your company wants to go, uh, if you want to go with a bunch of friends, we can create trips wherever you want to go. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like an actual corporate retreat yeah. team building. Yeah, or we'll do, you know, we do a lot of time, a lot of private trips for the Grand Canyon. So if, you know, if, okay. if, if, a, if a company of 20 employees wants to go do rim to rim and they want to just do it together, then we'll put it all together. Sounds like a Red Hog Media team building. There you event. go. There you go. I don't know if we could all make it. <laughs> <laughs> we might We might just have to do like a half trip. Yeah, we'll do it for 2024. <laughs> Let's go to the gift shop, to the restaurant. <laughs> To the Overlook, and then back to the parking lot. You probably don't need us for that. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Well, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, this has been fun. Yeah, for sure. Okay, everybody, you know how to find them, and we'll see you on the next one. 